Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the August 9th, 2021 City Council meeting. I'll now call the meeting to order. Please note that this meeting is being attended by City Council and staff via Zoom teleconference. Thank you for your patience as we continue to navigate city business through this meeting process. For the benefit of the public and as required by the Brown Act, the vote will be by roll call. City Clerk, would you please take the roll? Yes, Mayor Kalmick. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Verapapa is on his way in. Council Member um, Moore. Here. Council Member Sestarsik. Here. And Council Member Masalavit. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, it's time for approval of the agenda and waiver of the full reading of resolutions and ordinance. By a motion of the City Council, this is the time to notify the public of any changes to the agenda and or rearrange the order of the agenda. Does anyone wish to pull a consent calendar item? Okay, I would like to pull item E. And City Clerk, do we have any supplemental communications? Yes, four supplemental, I'm sorry, five supplemental communications were received. They've been distributed to council and made available to the public on the city's website. Very good, thank you. So I will call for a motion and a second for the items not pulled from the consent calendar. I move approval of the uh, uh, agenda except for item E. We have a second, please. Second. Thank you. Could we have a roll call vote? Mayor Kalmick, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Verapapa is not in the meeting as of yet. Council Member Sestarsik, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Moore, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Masalaba, how do you vote? Yes. All right. Thank you. That passes 4 0. Okay, now it's time for presentations and recognitions. I'll call upon our finance director, City Treasurer Kelly Telford on a COVID-19 funding update. Thank you very much. Tonight, I would like to give you an update on the various funding sources we have received related to COVID-19 and what each of those funding sources can be used for. A lot has changed over the past year and a half and things continue to change today. Next slide, please. Since the COVID-19 pandemic started in March 2020, the city has received funding from nine sources. This slide shows a quick reference list of those nine sources to date. Next slide. Some of this is gonna be repetitive as we went over it uh, last year when we started receiving funding from federal sources, but I wanted to give you an update of where we're at with some of these today. First, let's discuss the FEMA Public Assistance Grant. This is the one that we've been talking about since day one, where FEMA, through the declaration of the emergency, will reimburse us for 100% of eligible costs. You may recall that originally, FEMA was only reimbursing us for 75% of costs, but this has since changed to 100%. This is the most restrictive of all of the funding sources that the city has received, and only pays for costs that were not originally budgeted for, such as overtime, uh, PPE, like face masks, gloves, um, sanitizing products and equipment, and other materials and supplies that the city would not have needed if COVID-19 hadn't occurred. We've been submitting the reimbursement packages and will continue to submit them until the emergency is closed out. That's why you're, you see the status as ongoing. Next slide, please. The next funding source is the CARES Act funding, which the city has actually, re actually received three grants, 
Two were from the County of Orange and one was from the state of California. For the County of Orange grants, uh, one was for 562,000 and every dollar of this went back into the Seal Beach business community in the form of small business grants. The second grant for 204,000 provided for reimbursement of costs similar to FEMA. However, they did change the requirements late in the program to make it less restrictive, which allowed us to reimburse the general fund for the direct public safety response to COVID-19. This was fully utilized for public safety costs for the police department, marine safety, and public works. So as we stand today, both of these two county grants have been fully expended. Next slide, please. The city also received CARES Act grants from the state of California totaling $308,000. This is very similar to the county money that we received and provides for reimbursement costs similar to FEMA. And again, uh, just like with the state funding, they ended up changing the requirements to make them less restrictive and it allowed us to reimburse the general fund for the direct public safety response for COVID-19. And as of now, these funds have been fully expended. Next slide, please. The city was also awarded an additional $50,000 in community development block grant funds from the County of Orange. This grant was fully utilized in support of the city's temporary outdoor dining program that council approved in June, 2020 and has today been fully expended. Next slide, please. In the spring, the city was awarded 77,000 in funds from the County of Orange General Fund to provide for another round of small business grants. This one was unique in that it was not a federal grant, rather the County Board of Supervisors approved funding for each supervisorial district to help the business community. As of today, these funds have been fully expended. Next slide, please. We're going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because I know it's probably of the most interest to council and to the community. The newest funding source comes from the American Rescue Plan Act, commonly referred to as ARPA. These funds come to us from the United States Department of Treasury, and the city expects to get nearly $6.3 million based on the most recent estimates available. We did receive 50% of this in July 2021, so just last month and the remainder is expected next July in 2022. There's a wide range of allowable expenses for ARPA funds. Um, I'll go over some of them in a little bit, a little bit of detail. Um, the first allowable expense is responding to the public health emergency and the negative economic impacts caused by COVID-19. These are gonna be costs very similar to other funding sources uh, like PPE, um, overtime, um, but they are adding additional assistance programs, such as allowing for vaccine incentives, return to work incentives, and eviction prevention programs. There are a lot of other allowable costs under this umbrella, but the one that most of the cities are talking about is the provision that allows for an investment in improving outdoor spaces. For example, investments in parks, public plazas, and other public outdoor recreation spaces that promote healthier living environments and outdoor recreation and socialization. Uh, we have all seen the push to get people outside and it looks like the federal government is providing a resource to cities to rebuild recreational facilities. In the second bullet point under allowable expenses, you can see revenue losses uh, are, are an allowable cost. The intention of this uh, was to allow cities to recoup lost revenues from the decline in the economy uh, from the, the COVID-19 pandemic. When we received the guidelines for this funding source, uh, it got a little bit tricky because they're doing a very complex calculation to determine how much a city can claim for revenue losses. Um, and they're attempting to apply that standard across all cities uniformly. This has been the subject of a lot of debate between us finance directors and the, the, the US Department of Treasury because a lot of cities similar to Seal Beach, we pa who, uh, passed a transaction tax in 2018, just like our measure BB. And ultimately the way they're doing this calculation ends up penalizing us and may, uh, the end result is us being able to claim less revenue losses. 
Um, on the surface, it looks like it actually might show that there's no revenue loss at all, which we all know is not the case. Um, we, along with many other cities across California, submitted uh, comments to the U.S. Department of Treasury a couple of weeks ago, requesting them to specifically look at these items um, and, and identify uh, really to look and make sure that we're not losing out on the, the revenue loss opportunity just because our council and our community took action to help address some of our financial challenges from previous years. Um, this one I do anticipate we're going to have more information on um, as the, in the coming weeks as, as the next two or three months go by as well. Um, it's still being evaluated. And as of today, we still don't have an answer on a final decision for this. Another allowable use is infrastructure improvements related to water, sewer, and broadband projects. And then the fourth item that they're allowing, um, which I, I was surprised is a separate section in the guidelines altogether, is premium pay for essential workers. Um, I mentioned these guidelines that the Department of Treasury has issued. These guidelines have actually been updated already three times in the past two months. And with the recent comments that many of us submitted, uh, the, the deadline was July 16th. The most recent update that was issued was July 19th and they did not address any of the questions and comments that we had previously posed. So we do anticipate that these guidelines will be updated yet again. Um, and each time they update those, uh, they tend to broaden the allowable uses. Because of that, we are not making any recommendations at this time on how we should use the funds. Um, we really wanna wait until there's a full scope of allowable uses so that we can make a good decision. Um, we've, in finance, we've learned from the CARES Act funding that making those decisions really early on provided some, some challenges from an accounting perspective, um, and we're hoping to prevent that uh, with this ARPA funding. So we will look to bring additional recommendations to council on this particular item um, in the coming months. Uh, next slide, please. So we did have a call last week with the County of Orange. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about how cities are going to be reimbursed for the staff time associated with staffing uh, vaccine clinics. Um, the county decided last week that they're going to move forward with a mutual aid agreement with Cal OES and FEMA. So we're actually going to, to be bringing a, an agreement forth in September to city council to be able to, to be a part of this mutual aid agreement so the city can be reimbursed for the staff time that we had put in for our employees to, to uh, work at those various vaccine events. Um, I'll have a little bit more information on this when we bring this item back to you in September. Next slide, please. And this is the last one. So last year, the city received word from OCTA of the desire to assist where they could uh, and with senior mobility being down, OCTA saw the opportunity to move dollars into another senior program, which is senior meals. As you may know, the number of senior meals the city provided increased substantially with COVID-19. And with many seniors not leaving their homes, city staff made daily deliveries of meals to over 85 seniors in Seal Beach and up to 200 seniors on a weekly basis. OCTA has allowed us to go back to March 2020 and is picking up the cost for the increase in transportation costs up to our annual contract amount. And since we were under for the 2021 fiscal year, we were actually able to recoup quite a bit of costs. So that summarizes the nine funding sources we have to date. Uh, I would not be surprised if there are a couple of more on the, a couple more sources on the horizon and we will continue bringing updates back to council as we receive them. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kelly. <clears throat> Next uh, is oral communications. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take action on any item, not on the agenda unless authorized by law. No other business shall be considered. All email comments to the city clerk received before the start of the meeting were distributed to city council and made available to the public on the city's website. 
Email comments received after the start of the meeting will be forwarded to City Council after the meeting. City Clerk, do we have any emailed comments? Yes, Mayor, one email comment was received and it has been distributed to Council and made available to the public on the City's website. Thank you very much. City Attorney's Report, Mr. Steele. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, prior to the meeting this evening, all five Council members met in closed session regarding the items on the posted agenda and took no reportable action on any item. All right, thank you. City Manager's report, City Manager Ingram. Yes, thank you, Mayor. No items to report tonight, thank you. All right, time for Council comments. General council member comments and reporting pursuant to AB 1234. Uh, we'll start with council member Moore. I have no comments tonight, thank you. Okay, thank you. Council member Sestarsic. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I attended a, a regional military affairs committee meeting uh, and at that meeting, we had a presentation by OCFA Division I Battalion Chief Ron Roberts, and he gave an extensive report on firefighting helicopters. Talked about the new Chinook CH-47 helitankers, which can carry 3,000 gallons of water. Uh, a couple of those along with a couple of the Bell helicopters we've had in the past that carry less water and some Saborski uh, helicopters that all get together and help uh, during the fire season. So very informative and he did a great job and I thank uh, Chief Roberts very much for the report. Also at this meeting, the, um, the, base, the, the base over there released an environmental assessment for the Joint Forces Training Base Solar Energy Project. Uh, they are looking at building or putting, uh, having someone come in and put a couple of solar arrays over there, which will uh, contribute to the regional electric grid. And it will also make it possible for them in the event of a uh, catastrophe attack uh, or just a major outage to be able to generate enough electricity to uh, support the installation in their role as an um, emergency command center. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot of, lot of information in this and you can find a copy of it at the Los Alamitos Rossmore Library or the Mary Wilson Library. Comments are being accepted now from uh, July 25th up through July, uh, uh, excuse me, August 24th, 2021. And you may also obtain an electronic copy of the documents by contacting Sam Pett at sam.pett at tetratech.com. So, Anyone who's interested in this uh, can be sure and check it out. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, Council Member Farapapa. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Kalmick. Um, nothing to report, but I did want to give a big thank you to Public Works and Landscaping and Parks and Rec for all the um, recent work done, um, specifically the uh, potholing around town. Um, that stuff doesn't go unnoticed. Um, landscaping extensively in and around town. And most recently, some pavement striping around McGaw Elementary School. I really appreciate the work that um, everybody's doing uh, near and around there. I just, a quick reminder that school at McGaw does start um, August 16th, next week, I believe it is. So get ready for all the kids and all the traffic out there and please be careful and drive very slowly in and around town and especially around the school. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mike. Council Member Masalavitz. I had just a few things. <clears throat> the Orange County uh, Sanitation District had a board meeting a couple of weeks ago and uh, uh, it's my pleasure to report to you that 
uh, there's been an audit and they, uh, everything looks good. Uh, everything, all the regulations were followed. So that's a good positive. Um, also another positive is the near completion of the sewer um, lines in Westminster. So soon they'll be leaving there and um, it'll be a com completed job. Uh, and once again, the OC SAN has proven its ability to stay within its budget and um, to be in a good position for um, financing uh, mechanisms to complete projects. And I'm happy to say that it's a well-run uh, district for us. Um, another well-run district, of course, is Mosquitoes. The Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control is busy. Um, <clears throat> most of you have heard that uh, there was a West Nile virus incident in Garden Grove and um, We'll see uh, if it grows from there. Uh, we know that it'll probably be an active season. So be careful of what's around you, who's keeping water uh, in those dishes in the pots, in their flower pots. And maybe there's a, a pool near your home that is not used and may be turning green. Um, if you would report it to, uh, OS to uh, Orange County Vector Control, they uh, will send someone out to investigate. And if you're having a, a problem with mosquitoes in general, give them a call, ask them for tips, and um, perhaps then a um, employee will be able to come out and take a look at what's around your garden and part of the neighborhood. So um, be aware that there is something you can do. It might not uh, end your mosquito issue, but it could decrease it. So uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a couple of items. Um, just to let folks know that uh, we're, we're very close to having um, final approval uh, for the sand replenishment project for Surfside, which is several years um, in arrears. And this is something that, um, you know, all of our elected folks have been fighting for. And uh, finally, um, Congresswoman Michelle Steele was able to get the final voice and, and um, get an appropriation in the amount of around fifteen and a half million dollars, which will go a long way toward um, accomplishing this. We still need the final approval from the the Army Corps of Engineers that it's going to be on their what's called their work program, um, and this will help to protect what amounts to seventeen miles of coastline ranging from, you know, our westerly border all the way down to uh, Newport Beach. So hopefully that'll happen. Um, at a, one of the uh, several mayor's uh, conference calls that uh, I'm on, um, with regard to Senate Bill 9 and Senate Bill 10, which have uh, wide ranging consequences with regard to um, housing density and what um, folks will be allowed to build by right. Uh, they actually had the guest speaker of um, Scott Wiener, who is uh, the author of uh, SB 10 and the co-author of SB 9. And he makes a very, you know, in his mind, a very strong case that we need to allow multi-family dwellings on single lots. And so we have to be, uh, you know, very attentive to what the results of this are gonna be. It's already passed uh, the um, assembly, I believe, and now it goes to the Senate. So we have to keep an eye on that. Um, very important, I want to um, 
make an announcement. This has been done uh, today via press release and will be on our website. But uh, since the uh, City of Seal Beach Council at our last meeting approved the articles of incorporation and the initial bylaws for the inception of the Seal Beach Historic Resources Foundation, um, and we are ready to begin uh, receiving applications for the initial five member board and uh, the, the makeup of the board will be um, decided by the council based on the ability of the candidates to invest the time and effort during this initial period uh, to get the, uh, the foundation up and running. So uh, you do not actually have to be a resident of the city or of any particular district. So uh, those applications can be um, found on the website. It's actually a standard board appointment application. And so I encourage those people who think they would have an interest um, you know, in serving on this, uh, please uh, get those applications in. The official deadline is uh, August the 27th. So that still gives us you a couple of weeks and uh, spread the word if you happen to know somebody that would have an interest in uh, in serving uh, on this board. Uh, potentially, we're going to be talking to uh, Lions Club regarding the Little Blue House, which, uh, you know, they basically control at this point, as well as the red car. So um, again, I encourage participation in that. And that's all that I have for my questions and reports. Next item is the consent calendar. Items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and are enacted by a single motion with the exception of items removed by council members. So I'd like a motion and a second, please. Motion to approve. I'm not sure who won, but uh, we have a motion. How about a second? Sandra for the motion. Okay. Was that you, Mike? No. I'll second. This is Tom. That was Tom. Oh, okay, good. Tom, seconded by Council Member Moore. May we have a uh, vote, please, City Clerk? And just for the record, item yeah. A has been removed. Yes, correct. So, Mayor, Mayor Kelmick, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mayor Pro Tem Papa, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Sestarsik, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Moore, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Masalabit, how do you vote? Yes. That passes 5 0. Uh, the item that uh, I chose to remove is the second reading and adoption of ordinance 1691, which is the ordinance amending chapter 8.20 of the Seal Beach Municipal Code to amend regulations for head in parking in the city parking lots. The question being uh, our current ordinance um, cause calls for uh, folks that have backed into a parking space as opposed to heading in are uh, subject to a citation. And uh, at the time, I uh, did vote in the affirmative, but uh, I had raised a couple of questions as to possible alternatives to this. And what I would like to do is to um, move this forward so that we could possibly entertain some additional discussion on this. What I, in fact, would be proposing is that, um, number one, that we replace the existing head-in only signs that are in the beach parking lots, the 8th Street, 10th Street, and 1st Street lots, um, that uh, we are now possibly recognizing as being um, not optimum in terms of their being able to be seen or read. And I would like uh, to um, have warnings rather than citations issued 
uh, for the rest of this calendar year to give us a better assessment of if visitors to our city or residents uh, want to park in the beach lots and are not familiar necessarily with the fact that you're supposed to uh, head in only, um, that perhaps we need to do a better job in um, letting them know that that's going to be a necessity and if you don't you're going to be fined um, rather than having over 4,000 people cited uh, who I don't believe are necessarily scoff laws and so if there is uh, at that however that would not uh, affect um, the issue of having to have a front license plate um, you know, unless it's not available in your state, those would still be citable. So I would like to uh, get the council's comments and possibly support to uh, act on this. Uh, and I'll, I will take the comments and then I'd like a clarification from our city attorney in terms of how we would uh, proceed. So, um, let's start uh, with Councilman Moore. Yeah, I guess if we did it do that that way, you're proposing we revisit this and at, yes. at what point? Yes. In at the January or something? Yes. Was there a question or an opinion along with that? Um, uh, I, I guess, I mean, if, if there's been uh, 4,000 tickets or so, I think it's pretty evident that there's an issue where people are getting heavily ticketed that don't realize that that's, uh, the, you know, the law there. And I, I just I just feel kind of how I originally... Uh, felt about this issue. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Masalavit. I do have kind of a comment. Um, I agree with you, Mr. Mayor, that we need to take a look at how the signing uh, is in place, what signing is in place, and what we need to make it more legible for people to see and understand. Um, I'm not looking for a, a plethora of signage in the lots, but um, some distinctive signage that people will be able to see when they come in or while they're driving around. Um, I, I agree with this. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward to the information that we can get from what you're proposing. Thank you. Council Member Sestarsik. So, sorry, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, I. that's fine whenever, you know, if we wanna study it, that's fine with me. I was just concerned you know, my own experience that I wasn't sure the, the signs were visible, but I, and I, I think I mentioned that a warning was okay with me. I was just concerned that people weren't seeing them and were getting ticketed when that wasn't, our intent wasn't a uh, trap of some kind. It was just uh, to, to have it be a certain way. So, uh, uh, looking at the looking at the numbers or seeing what happens when we if we give a warning, especially if it's out of town people who just don't see it, that uh, sounds fine to me. And then and then I think um, Councilman Moore was asking, would it come back at the end of the year to s tell us how we did or well, that would uh, be what we that would be my proposal. Number one, that we would tabulate the number of warnings that were issued um, 
and then you know bring that information back to council uh you know at the beginning of the new year calendar year and then make a decision at that point whether we want to continue to um, change the ordinance or keep the existing ordinance with improved signage okay that sounds fine thank you thank you councilman Verapapa. yeah i would agree with that too that sounds like a good idea and a good review um, to look at and monitor thank you thank you uh, and I've already pretty much made my comments. So I'd ask our city attorney how we proceed and, and what would be, you know, the action for this evening. I, can I speak one more time? Sure. Um, is, is on the technology side, uh, if we w give a warning for the first time, is that is the technology capable of seeing that the person was issued a warning the first time and giving a ticket the second time they um, after they've received a first warning. Um, I would have to defer to uh, our chief or his representative. Well, good evening, Mayor. And uh, to answer your question, Councilmember Moore, yes, those are all tracked into our current system and we're able to track any kind of warning that is provided given that they do have a license plate <clears throat> that we're able to tie it to. So the answer to your question is yes. Okay, so that, that might be a suggestion for staff if it, as another alternative to provide a first, you know, when we do revisit this in January to provide a first time warning and then the second time they get a ticket if they've yep. committed that offense again. I agree. Good point. Thank you. So, uh, City Attorney, in, uh, Craig, can you give us some direction at this point? Uh, yes, Mayor. Um, well, you don't have to take or uh, take any action on item E. Um, the ordinance doesn't take effect if there's if there's no vote on it. So, um, I think I think staff has. Um, adequate direction based on the comments of the council. And uh, if you just take no action on item E, that's the way that staff can proceed. Very good, thank you. So um, seeing that we seem to have consensus on support of doing that, then let's take no action. Okay, we have no public hearings under un finished or continued business, uh, we're going to get a report on our local coastal program, um, the land use plan and the Coastal Commission's comments. So we'll have uh, Community Development or Interim Community Development Director Barry Curtis, please give us that report. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, the item before you this evening, um, is before you this evening in order to provide a status update on the effort to establish a local coastal program for the city of Seal Beach and to bring the city council's attention to a few of the key um, review comments received from the Coastal Commission um, as a result of its review of the draft local coastal program land use plan. Um, the staff team presented this item to the city council on June 28th. Um, the staff team consists of city staff and staff from Michael Baker International, the city's consultant. Um, after discussion, the city council indicated a desire for additional time to consider the issues and directed staff to return at a later date when the council could work through each of the items. The effort, um, as you know, to complete the local coastal program has been a lengthy process. The draft LCP was um, completed about a year and a half ago. The draft plan was then submitted to the Coastal Commission. After its review, the commission forwarded its comments back to the city for consideration. The city staff team um, has reviewed the Coastal Commission's comments and most have either been um, addressed or are currently being addressed. However, there are a few comments that we believe warrant bringing this to the attention of the city council. These consist of five items and these were presented to the council on June 28th and will be the focus of tonight's presentation and discussion as well. The Michael Baker team has been administering the LCP process for the city and developing our LCP. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you Noelle Steele from Michael Baker International, 
Noel has a brief presentation for you that will cover the key review comments that are um, were received by the Coastal Commission. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn over the presentation to Noel. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Hello, Mr. Mayor, Hello, all council members. Thank you so much for having me again. Um, I We can go ahead and go, get started on the next slide. We'll give a brief recap of um, what we talked about last time and include some recommendations and some items for further consideration to council. Um, but just to give us a quick background, uh, the local coastal program consists of two elements, the land use plan and the local implementation plan. For the purposes of our policy discussion, we'll really be focusing on the land use plan. This is the item where uh, uh, Coastal Commission has um, provided their comments and is our area of focus for this evening. Um, the benefits of having a certified LCP, obviously the city is able to um, issue permits and you are uh, delegated your permit authority from the Coastal Commission to the city. And, um, and the permit process is streamlined instead of through Coastal Commission. Um, next slide. And as Barry mentioned up at the front, this is just a summary of where we are in the process. Um, as we provided our uh, these comments to City Council on June 28th, we are um, hoping to seek some feedback on the comments received and hopefully are available to answer any additional questions that might come up. Uh, next slide. All right, so with our first comment as it relates to sea level rise, um, I'd like to give a little bit of further of an explanation as compared to last time. Um, the intent of this comment from Coastal Commission and specifically the requested text that is added in double underline is really to formalize two coastal act sections, the 30235 and 30253. Um, and both of these items relate to future construction of shoreline protection. Um, the intent behind these policies is just to internalize the risks of building in an inherently hazardous area. Um, and these uh, residents in Seal Beach are subject to both of these Coastal Commission requirements when they permit projects through the Coastal Commission. Um, next slide. And similar to our, um, our requested policy language that was on the uh, previous slide, um, this slide includes the, the item as the conditional approval um, applicants shall waive rights to construct such devices that may exist under applicable law. Um, again, this formalizes the, the same Coastal Act sections. And as a final note, um, deed restrictions have been applied by the Coastal Commission to properties in areas of known hazards um, dating back to the 1990s. So, this is um, fairly standard practice for the last 30 odd years or so uh, in terms of Coastal Commission behavior. And, um, and again, that the policy uh, requested additional text is, um, is just to formalize existing Coastal Act language. Uh, next slide, please. And while this item is um, similar in nature as it relates to sea level rise, we're getting a little bit um, more specific in terms of its reference to land divisions, um, including the, the items listed here, lot splits, lot line adjustments, certificates of compliance. Um, to add a bit more detail on this item, um, our, our recommendation on the first policy is to include a specific uh, definition as to what constitutes a beachfront lot. As you can see, this, um, this policy is specifically, um, specifically limited to uh, those subdivisions and land divisions that would create new beachfront lots. Um, and so that would be a text edition that's fairly easy for Michael Baker to incorporate into the LCP and um, wouldn't create any additional uh, work efforts on, on that end. Um, the second policy recommendation is a little bit more specific and re would require applicants to demonstrate that the project is designed to avoid or avoid and mitigate flooding hazards. Um, and those would include potential flooding hazards associated with sea level rise. Um, but similar to the way um, similar to the way applicants are, are required to show that they are um, mitigating for hazard or erosion or geologic hazards, um, it's, it's really required that the city, um, the city must find, or the city must identify these findings consistent with the policy at the term of, um, at the term of permit issuance. So again, just to reiterate, our recommendation would be to outline specifically what a beachfront law is and, um, and uh, to, to formalize the, the text that is um, requested in double underline. Um, next slide. All right, um, this is our item on 
public access. Um, and so as many people here know, um, a Coastal Commission priority is to ensure public access to the California coastline. Um, however, this policy priority area can be in conflict with the property rights of private or gated communities along the coast that were often um, created prior to the establishment of the Coastal Act in 1972. And so Surfside Colony is one example of, of such a community. There are, there are several up and down the California coast. Um, this part one of the comment, uh, the Coastal Commission framed it as a way just to open discussion regarding the recommended policy inclusion. Um, Michael Baker's recommended response on behalf of the city really would be to initiate that conversation and understand um, understand Coastal's perspective. Um, our recommendation would be to remind them that Surfside Colony is operating within their rights um, and, and their property rights to maintain a private community and um, to understand that if this policy is, um, is something that's absolutely necessary for Seal Beach to incorporate in their LCP. Um, to date, uh, Michael Baker and, um, and city staff has not discussed uh, this policy language with Coastal yet, so this would be the first time that we are discussing with them. Um, part two would be, or at part two recommends rephrasing, um, rephrasing LUP language content and furthering the discussion of public access and Surfside Colony. Um, the intent, um, the intent the, of the language in bold that I wrote um, was just to provide background information and was really to demonstrate that Surfside Colony is not expanding outside of their existing footprint. Um, clarification upon the text, it, it should say redevelopment instead of new development. Um, it's one of those minor language items that in a policy perspective has a, has a significantly different meaning. Um, but, you know, the average person, it might not, uh, might not mean too many, too much difference. So changing the term from redevelopment uh, should satisfy, um, satisfy Coastal's understanding on this item. And um, again, their, their discussion uh, regarding how public access may be maximized uh, would include in coordination with the response on, on part one above, just to open the floor for discussion and to understand um, where we could potentially negotiate with Coastal Commission. Um, and then our next slide, please. This is our policy question from Coastal Commission as it relates to low cost visitor serving accommodations. Um, so under Coastal Act section 30213, uh, lower cost visitor serving accommodations shall be protected, encouraged, and where feasible, provided. Um, so as some background, as the short term rentals and other home sharing websites have become more popular in recent years, Coastal Commission has provided some policy guidance to regulate short-term rentals as an opportunity to increase public access opportunities. Um, and the background on our side of things is that we've been told by um, city staff and, and our discussion with council last time is that there may be some um, interest in opening up the existing short-term rental program, um, open up the applications for new permits. Um, and while we know that uh, it's likely that, um, or it's unlikely that the short-term rentals will um, constitute low-cost accommodations. Um, this is just an opportunity to reevaluate the, the issuing uh, of new short-term rental permits. Um, Coastal Commission cannot um, mandate cost of units um, or anything of that sort. Um, and generally speaking, Coastal has opposed, um, they've opposed vacation rental bans in the coastal zone, um, citing bans as inconsistent with the Coastal Act, but um, they do support regulating short-term rentals. Um, so we would just need further clarification from council or staff if there is interest in opening the, the rental permits for new applications, or if the preference is to the, uh, keep the moratorium as it is. Um, either option is fine. We would just need um, further direction before we uh, return to conversation with Coastal Commission. Um, next slide, please. This is um, our comment on parking. Um, from our understanding, the parking meters in um, Seal Beach and in Old Town were installed on Main Street in the 1960s. Um, and just for reference, the Coastal Act was uh, enacted in 1972. Um, it looks like the, based on the history of, um, history of the CDPs that the parking meters were removed in 1976. Um, and then in 2004, the Coastal Commission um, approved a CDP to authorize um, parking meters on Main Street, rest restrictions of parking um, on 5th Street to 12th Street, and um, some after the fact approval for um, parking meter spaces along Main Street as well. Um, this, there's less of a um, tangible recommendation on this item. We would just um, appreciate the, the 
um, assistance to go back to Coastal Commission and discuss our approach. Um, Coastal Commission is asking if the preferential parking districts should be incorporated into the LCP. Um, and while they don't necessarily have to, um, you know, it would obviously be preferred if it was, um, we would just like to discuss with them um, and understand their um, understand their desire and their um, their confusion on this one. Um, next slide, please. And then just to summarize, again, our recommendations for further action, um, our comment ones on sea level rise, we really, th this was more of just a, just a FYI to everyone um, involved in, in the project that um, these comments are, or these, um, this language is being requested to be addition, or is requested to be added into the LUP as the coastal has provided. Um, our recommendation on the sea level rise as it relates to land divisions is to really clearly define that beachfront lot to prevent um, application to other lots uh, in the city. Um, we will, on the comment number three, we will clarify the development versus redevelopment and um, op hopefully open up the floor for discussion with Coastal Commission before taking further action. Um, to comment number four, we would just appreciate direction um, in or opening up the short-term rental permits for new applicants if there's interest or not. And then comment number five is just, uh, again, a, a notice to everyone that we will be discussing this approach with Coastal Commission to see if these, um, these should be incorporated into the LCP. Um, and Barry, I believe that is our final slide. Um, I would, unless you have anything else to add, I, I'd welcome, um, welcome thoughts and, and consideration and open the floor for any questions from, from myself or the project team. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, may I comment first? Sounds like you're having trouble with Zoom. There we go. It's bad. No, it wouldn't unmute. Yes. Uh, Sandra, I just please. I just wanted to ask if they could back up a slide, I think to page 10. Right, so we can have these, each of these items in front of us when uh, we discuss them. Excellent. So that other people in the audience can see what we're talking about. Okay, did you wanna go ahead with any comments or questions? Uh, not yet, I, I will probably want to do that as we get down into the comments. I don't know how you're going to set this up. If we go through comment one, comment two, three, or each of us says, this is how I feel about comment three or four or five. I don't um, know how that. Um, why don't we, why don't we try uh, doing general comments referring to any one of the numbers one through five. So pick you, you know, pick whichever ones you wish to speak about. Well, as long as I've got my mute button off, can, I'll start. <laughs> yeah. um, the definition of beachfront lot ought to be fairly easy to do. Um, it depends on where they're going to consider beachfront. Um, you know, does it go all the way up to Boeing or does it stay on the immediate beach? Um, and comment three, uh, development versus redevelopment. I think that is a discussion to approach with the Coastal Commission because um, it really is a matter of definition. You know, it's each one's going to redevelop separately. Maybe redevelopment means a broader sense of a project instead of develop. I don't know. I, I don't know what they're thinking. And <clears throat> for visitor accommodations, in terms of opening up short-term rental permits, that's fine and good, but there is no mechanism for keeping they're anywhere near affordable. So what is the Coastal Commission's st 
expand on putting short-term rental permits in place or forcing us to put short-term rental permits in place if there are no benefits for moderately income people to take advantage of them. Um, we, you know, it, we went through this early uh, in my public career here. I, I think when I was on the planning commission, we now require, or we did require conditional use permit for um, short-term rentals. And then we put in a moratorium on any new applications. So what do we have to do, open them up again? I don't think the neighbors will be happy because they're the ones that really came out and um, objected uh, to really to the active the activity of short term rentals that were adjacent to them, and I'm confused about the parking. I need I need to. I sort of understand what they're trying to say, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just dense, and I need somebody to explain this to me. And that's all I have. Mr. Mayor, do you would you like staff to address these as we go or just wait till the end? I was muted again. Uh, yes, I would uh, prefer that you you and staff um, make comments now. I mean, as they come up, and I think it'll help to, you know, uh, keep in mind, you know, what the responses were. Yes, sir. Um, Noel, if you could join me on these responses, I'll probably point several of them towards you. Um, first one is what constitutes beachfront um, a beachfront lot? Can you describe that quickly? Yes, we would we would define that in the LUP as um, one of the property um, boundaries, you know, abutting the Sandy Beach. Um, definitely not including any definitions of anything inland as constituting a beachfront lot. Okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I am to please. <laughs> And, um, moving towards item number four with the short-term rentals, um, Councilmember Messalavit, you're correct that, um, and, and I think Noel did touch on this, um, there's nothing that the coastal can do to require us to restrict the cost of those so they could be very expensive and not necessarily um, affordable. Um, and you, you kind of pushed in as to what, whether or not the commission, I believe, could force the city to allow more short-term rentals and, and that's really not the case. It's just something that they'd like to encourage the city to consider. Yes. I like um, that answer too. And, and, yes, and a coastal, coastal Commission has, has released guidance in the past that has clearly indicated they cannot and will not, they do not have the legal authority to mandate the cost of any, any visitor accommodation, whether that's a hotel, a short-term rental, campsite, uh, what have you. So, so there's no need to worry about that one either. Great. Okay. And, and then, Noel, can you touch again on exactly what the Coastal Commission is recommending or, or requesting through their comment number five on parking? Yes. And to be quite honest, they their comment is a fairly nebulous in general, especially the last sentence. They just want to discuss preferential parking districts with the city. Um, what I would venture to guess that they're getting at is that Generally speaking, um, preferential parking districts are not um, preferred from the Coastal Commission's perspective. Um, going back to their um, going back to their policy area of um, public access, um, there's always the thought for, on their behalf that preferential parking districts um, could potentially uh, restrict uh, visitors from parking in coastal areas. Um, however, 
going back to the permitting authorities and, and approved CDPs that we've walked through, um, I don't believe that this is really the issue. I think that they probably just need to be walked through the permitting history and that these preferential parking districts were in fact um, authorized under a, a CDP in 2004. Um, so, so hopefully not too complicated of an issue, but bringing that forth in a discussion and, um, and outlining this uh, permitting history and um, you know, making the case that this should be, since it was permitted, it should be incorporated into the LCP and then um, understanding Coastal's stance if they have a legitimate reason for why it shouldn't be um, incorporated into the LCP. Um, unfortunately, I, I wouldn't be able to speculate on why that would be, um, but hopefully once we discuss, we'll be able to know further. Uh, just can I make a comment on comment three? Uh, yeah. There was some talk in the staff report about leaving Surfside um, as like an independent community that would have to deal with the Coastal Commission on its own. Um, do you have it? I mean, I, I understand what you said that the Coastal Commission doesn't feel as though it has uh, jurisdiction over their beach because it's private. So would that make it easier for the city to approve or disapprove projects there? Or does it make it more complicated so that Surfside has to become uh, its own little independent area that has to deal with the Coastal Commission on its own? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and Barry, if you don't mind me just jumping in. Um, we, that option to exclude Surfside from the LC, uh, the LUP, um, its official term is called the Deferred Certification. Um, that's just an option on the table for, um, for us to know and for us to be aware of. Um, I definitely would um, recommend uh, allowing our team um, to discuss our approach with Coastal Commission um, to see if there's a way to negotiate some policy language or um, a negotiated approach that is um, advantageous on behalf of both the city and Surfside and um, and you know uh, approved by Coastal Commission um, before we uh, you know to hopefully include Surfside into the LUP so that the city could issue permits for things like the, the redevelopments like we were talking about if someone has a one story and wants to add a two story it would be um yeah it would be much more efficient to come through the city for something like that versus coastal commission um that being said you know we can't predict um how coastal will um how you know how, how this approach will will be discussed with coastal um if it doesn't look like there's a way to move forward in a way that the, is both acceptable to the city and coastal commission um we could enact the, um, the deferred certification area that we were talking about. Um, it's just a tool in the toolbox and an option on the table if, um, if, if okay. discussions and negotiations are, you know, don't- That's what I was like, thinking it would be our fallback position. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, all right, I think those were my questions. And, and Councilmember Masalava, just to clarify one more thing, if we were to go that route, if the city council was to make that decision at some later date, um, the, the rest of the city would benefit of having an LCP. Surfside would be in the same position they are currently with having to go yeah. through. Yeah, I get that. Okay. okay. Mayor, Mayor, this is the chief real quick, if I can jump in for one second. Sure. Uh, Ms. Steele and, and Barry, I was wondering if uh, maybe we can also have uh, another conversation with Julie Dixon, if she can be roped into some of these questions that relates to parking. I think it's kind of uh, beneficial to have her on that parking project, and then she might be able to provide us some guidance in the future as well. Just a thought. Absolutely, Chief. Thank you. Very good. Okay, let's move to uh, Councilman Barapapa. Your questions, comments? No, thank you. Very informative and good questions. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Sestarsik. Uh, thank you. Um, I, 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 maybe I'm wrong, but what I thought Surfside was people were not allowed to enter through Surfside, but if you park down south of there, you are allowed to walk up the beach because their property includes part of the beach, but not all of the beach. Is that not public access or am I wrong? You're, um, you're correct, Council Member. 
Okay. Um, and as far as the, the, the short-term rentals, I was at council meetings where the residents came in and talked about out of state or off site owners. They're, peop they're, they're here to have a good time. They're partying, they're bringing cars, their friends, and they're parking up the streets. They're up till midnight right outside their windows. It was not popular at all. So um, that's, that's a lot with everyone being so close. So anyway, that one, I think you need to go in carefully if you're looking at opening that one back up. So anyway, those are my comments. Thank you. Councilman Moore. Stucky Mayor, uh, how many permits are allowed now for short short term rentals? Councilmember Moore, I believe there are sixteen grandfathered uh, approvals. So, what is there a sense of if we increase that a small amount, if Coastal Commission would be? Uh, receptive to that? Noel, I don't know if uh, you have any idea as far as a, a number that they'd be looking for. I know it's basically just something that they were suggesting this to be considered. Yeah, okay. and they're not, they're not so much looking for an exact number. Um, you know, an option could be to include a policy in the LUP to study this item further. Um, you know, we certainly don't need to make a decision right now or even in the LUP or before it's adopted, um, but to make a policy that includes studying the issue further and identifying a uh, maybe a, you know a potential for additional units to be added onto the market um, right, to the accommodation market, that, that's certainly a, a solution that I think that they'd be they'd welcome. Okay. For for the parking one, you mentioned during the presentation uh, that. The, the meters on Main Street, uh, how does that relate to the, um, th your suggestion for approaching the pref preferential parking districts? Oh, so the meters, um, the meters on Main Street and the preferential parking districts were established under the same coastal development permit. Um, so the parking meters on Main Street is less of the issue. It was just a note that they were um, they were authorized under the same um, the same CDP at the same time. Is it, is that referring to the meters at the lots near Main Street? Because Main Street doesn't have meters currently. Yes, it's the um, lot on Main Street. Oh, sorry, Barry. Yes. That's okay. Council member, it is the lots off Main Street at uh, the 100 block and along Electric. Okay. Anything else? Um, what, what do you see as the next step here and, and what this, what's the timing? In terms of the next step would be um, using some of this feedback that we've received today, um, including some of our feedback that we received on the visitor serving accommodations. Um, to meet with Coastal Commission and um, start the negotiation process for the items that, that weren't for their discussion. Um, Michael Baker would um, continue incorporating edits into the LUP um, for review by, by the city planning staff team. And um, the next step would be um, coming to an agreement with Coastal Commission, sending out a, um, a draft land use plan and um, moving forward into the local implementation plan process and um, getting you a certified uh, local coastal program. Okay, is there any estimate on timing or? Uh, I believe our schedule needs to be updated, um, but I believe we had estimated about um, 14 months out or so for to the certified LCP. Um, but uh, obviously that's dependent on a couple of factors in terms of how quick it is to get Coastal Commission on the phone. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. No worries. Yeah, I had a, a 
couple of questions. Um, with regard to the definition of beachfront lot, it, it seems, and, and Barry, you could please correct me, that uh, the conditions that they're imposing on, on lots that are being, uh, you know, teardowns and, and rebuilds are the same um, that are being imposed on beachfront, where you're not allowed to do anything to mitigate uh, or prevent sea level rise, like any kinds of barriers or anything like that. Not that that would be practical, but um, is that correct so far that, that we seem to be including um, off beach property as well? Noel, can you talk about the, um, the difference in the way they consider the beachfront versus the rest of the, the lots that are in those areas? Yes, of course. Um, so based on the, the policy language that Coastal is recommending to in include under um, comment two, um, it, it kind of looks like a, beach, a lot that is a true beachfront lot on the sandy beach is considered to be in a hazardous location inherently, um, just because it's part of the one of the property lines is adjacent to sandy beach. Um, this application of issue of um, of showing that you have to, um, or I guess maybe a better way to explain it, um, applicants would only have to demonstrate that their project is outside of a hazard zone um, if it is truly located within a hazard zone, right? So if there is an inland property that is showing that it is um, repetitively flooded or is otherwise at risk for sea level rise. Then those, um, then those same policies would apply to the property, right? It would have to show if there was a redevelopment application or project application, it would have to show that those hazards would be mitigated. And it would be a very similar process as to showing, um, you know, if, if you had a property in a fire zone, you'd have to show that the property is, is self-mitigating, that it's not going to create a hazardous condition that, um, you know, for example, with a residence where people are going to be living in. Um, right. So, um, it, again, just to reiterate, for the beachfront lot purposes, it does look like that that is being held to a higher standard than the inland properties, and that inland properties would have to be in a hazard zone before they would have to um, demonstrate this ability to mitigate against it. So you can't mitigate unless the hazard's demonstrated well, to be this is This is the conundrum that, that I think we possibly will face, is that uh, they are... are making decisions or recommendations based on a 50-year projection of sea level rise where staff was um, recommending not to allow a lot split on property in the 300 block on 17th street um, which you know comes sort of into direct conflict and, and perhaps a, a larger question is in your discussion so far with the coastal commission are they aware of the potential uh, conflicts that will arise or that arise now with regard to the potential passage of SB9 and SB10, which encourages lot splits, encourages high density development? And the Coastal Commission is telling us, no, we don't want you to do that. And we don't want lot splits and we don't want you to increase density which basically includes <clears throat> pardon me virtually all of old town if you're if it's being based on the 50 year projection mm -hmm. so as part of this project so far we have not discussed anything any of these comments with coastal commission quite yet so that would be the time to you know i would recommend bringing that item to coastal commission because i do think is an, is an excellent point um so he's kind of receiving um, mixed messages from different state agencies, correct? So um, that is, is a, a question that I would recommend that our team brings to Coastal Commission when we discuss. Um, I, as the policy language that they recommended stands, I don't think inherently it is problematic. Um, however, the way that it, you know, it is applied by Coastal Commission in that, rec or, you know, that example that you had, Joe, from, um, from, or, uh, I'm sorry, Mayor Kalmick. Um, <laughs> from the, that um, example that you had in terms of being prevented from having a lot split, um, a lot split in an area that is inland and that is showing to be in a 2050 hazard zone, but is not currently 
um, having the impacts of that hazard zone, you know, I think that that's also a question to bring to them at this time as well. Okay. Um, with regard to the uh, short-term rental uh, situation, um, you know, once again, it's very unlikely that if they are looking at um, allowing or encouraging short-term rental permits, that the fact is that none of them are low cost. I mean, mm -hmm. we can demonstrate, you know, by giving them a copy of uh, Airbnb or VRBO rentals that are currently approved in town, not to mention the ones that aren't. And they certainly aren't um, low cost or even moderate. The only possibility that I know of would be um, the, uh, the area in the new First Street, uh, you know, development that uh, had to be set aside for visitor serving overnight accommodations. And we still don't, I don't think we actually know, um, you know, how that is going to be developed in terms of, you know, who owns the property now. I think Shea Home still owns it, but whether or not, you know, that question, um, you know, will come up with regard to that. But as far as the rest of the short-term rentals, um, you know, I don't think they'll be low cost under any circumstances. And furthermore, uh, by increasing the number of short-term rentals, you're reducing your uh, rental stock, um, which again is in conflict with the HCD, uh, mm -hmm. their directive and, and goal to increase housing density. So, uh, uh, you know, again, I think that as you guys negotiate, um, you know, with the Coastal Commission staff that, that maybe we can get them to sort of fess up to what is their plan? You know, what are they ultimately looking for? And are they aware of the, the conflict that they've really engaged in with HCD? And just my last comment would be, are, is are we going to need to discuss with the Coastal Commission our berm? that we put up every year. I have heard that there may have been some, one of their questions because it's never been permitted by the Coastal Commission. And of course we started doing it before there was a Coastal Commission. Yes, so we did receive um, a comment from Coastal Commission on that item. Um, I believe it was in section um, or a, a LUP chapter two. Um, it, Coastal Commission is aware that the berm is constructed annually without a coastal development permit. Um, their recommendation in this comment is um, fairly minor though, nothing to worry about. Um, they have asked um, our team to address the annual berm construction in the LUP policies. Um, you know, their question was if, if the berm is anticipated to continue, and obviously it is, um, and we would uh, discuss its consistency with chapter three policies. Um, so the chapter three policies is just the, the um, land use development policies. So um, the berm would be consistent with those policies. I'm happy to add the discussion on behalf of the city. Um, the final note from Coastal Commission does say that this activity does require a CDP, um, a, you know, an active or valid CDP. Um, but like we discussed last time, um, the CDPs can extend for multiple years. A five to 10 year range is something within the realm of, um, of possibility, depending on, um, depending on the um, other biological concerns that might be present. I, I wouldn't be able to speak on that without the full um, understanding of it, but the a programmatic CDP is, is possible to prevent, um, prevent you guys from having to go back to coastal annually since it is, a, it is an annual public works project. Very good. Well, thank you for all the answers. No worries. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments or questions from council? All right, so I guess we're going to call for a motion in a second to consider these five issue items and to uh, that are identified and we've provided the feedback and further guidance and and you guys will continue to work upon work on our behalf. So uh, may I have a 
Motion and a second. We do. Do we? Do we have a motion? Um, I mean, what we? What are, we're providing direction. I know. We do we need a motion? Well, um, how do I say City this? Clerk? It says here. I know what it says. I just, I, just, <laughs> I don't know. I, okay. I'm not right about a lot of things. So could our city attorney uh, address this? I, I think staff would, would appreciate kind of a, a formal blessing on the, uh, the five points that have been made and the, and the way moving forward. So I would suggest a motion Okay. Uh, would be appropriate. I'll, okay, I'll move it. Okay. Don't be shy, I may have a second. I'll second. Thank you. And city clerk, could we have a roll call vote? Yes, Mayor Kalmick, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mayor Pro Tem Papa, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Sistarsik, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Moore, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Masalaba, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. That passes 5 0. Next, we have a, a, uh, a brief study session with regard to uh, vehicle replacement um, by leasing rather than purchase. So I'll call on uh, City Treasurer and Finance Director Telford again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, members of the City Council, City staff, and community members watching at home tonight. Tonight, we are bringing to you the results of our research related to vehicle replacement options. If you recall, over the last two budget cycles, we have not budgeted for any new vehicle purchases in our vehicle replacement fund. During those budget study sessions, I've mentioned that we were evaluating options for vehicle replacement particularly looking at the option to lease vehicles. Tonight, we'd like to discuss with the council the option of moving from a purchasing model to a leasing model, specifically the option of leasing with enterprise fleet management. Next slide, please. During tonight's study session, we will be discussing the challenges that we are currently facing with the replacement of our fleet, and I will give a little background on what got us to this point. Then I will be in introducing Enterprise Fleet Management to discuss their leasing model that many organizations are already utilizing. Finally, I will go over next steps and we will be available to answer any of our councilmen, any council member questions. Next slide, please. Currently, the city's fleet includes 55 vehicles, which includes both public safety vehicles and non-public safety vehicles. Those non-public safety vehicles are primarily in our public works department and our city pool vehicles. Many of these vehicles are more than five years old and many are even over 10 years old. This results in increased maintenance costs and fuel costs from our vehicles and sometimes means vehicles are taken out of place, or I'm sorry, taken out of service for longer periods due to extraordinary maintenance, which as we know is more common in older vehicles. In order for the police department, marine safety, and public works to operate effectively, they need reliable vehicles to conduct day-to-day -day business in. Also, sometimes we forget that for those departments, their employees are in their assigned vehicles for the majority of their shifts. If their vehicle is out of service, it may mean it's one less vehicle patrolling or one less water truck responding to service requests. To address these issues, it takes a significant amount of capital, which the city has struggled with over the years. As you're aware, the city faced financial challenges from fiscal year 1617 through fiscal year 1819. And during those years, the city suspended the annual contributions to the vehicle replacement fund. Vehicles continued to be purchased, which, which used up the cash in the fund. Then with the passage of measure BB, the city was able to afford the annual contribution to the vehicle replacement fund once again, which started in fiscal year 1920. And of course, in March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And for both fiscal year 21, I'm sorry, 2021 and 21-22 budget cycles, the city was not able to set aside funds for vehicle replacement due to budgetary constraints. 
These financial challenges have compounded over the years and have made it, it an insurmountable task to bring our fleet to where it needs to be through a standard purchasing model. Once the issue was identified, Public Works and Finance started looking at options, which led us to evaluate the possibility of leasing. It was recommended to us by a number of agencies to look at enterprise fleet management. As many organizations as many organizations have already had success transitioning to their leasing model. In fact, two of our neighbors currently use Enterprise today. We've been working with them for over a year now to review our current vehicles and evaluate our maintenance costs in order to build a replacement plan that not only allows the city to address the current state of the fleet, but address these financial challenges as well. Next slide, please. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Fawn Kafka with Enterprise Fleet Management to discuss their analysis and observations of our fleet and the solutions their company can provide in helping us address these challenges. Fawn? Fawn, are you possibly on mute? Fawn, are you there? I'm sorry, can you hear me now? I can, but there's an echo. Can you hear me now? Hmm. Yes, but there's still an echo. Okay. That seems better. Sorry, folks, bear with us just one moment. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Go no ahead. Echoes? No echoes. Go ahead. You're good to go. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. Uh, my name is Vaughn Kafka, and I've been with Enterprise for 25 years. We've been helping a lot of municipalities streamline the budget, capital budget process, bridge funding gaps, and lower operational expenses for ever since we've actually started as a private company in 1957. Next slide, please. And how we've helped our clients is through strategic acquisition planning. Uh, we help them with the resale of their vehicles and take a look at the total overall uh, cost of ownership of their vehicles, how to reduce administrative uh, time and also control costs, consolidation, and capture data so that we can help you better manage your fleet of vehicles. Next slide, please. Enterprise is a company we've been in business since 1957. We manage close to 2 million vehicles worldwide. We have about 9,600 locations and we help a lot of municipalities with everything having to do with their fleet because we, own and manage our own fleet of vehicles. So with the experience of managing our own fleet, we're able to provide the economies of scale and um, knowledge to help our municipal customers with their own fleet. Next slide, please. In Southern California alone, we are able to help give back to the state and local governments in 119 million dollars worth of tax revenues. We um, have about $239 million in purchases with local vendors and suppliers in Southern California. Our employees um, donate about $2 million to the United Way with matching contributions from our company. And we actually give back to our, the communities that we partner with in foundation grants, um, totaling up to about $680,000 annually. Next slide, please. Like Kelly mentioned, many of the cities that we work with, um, we've been doing business with them for many, many years. For example, the city of Santa Ana, we've been partnering with them for 23 years, since 1998. City of Westminster since uh, 2011, so over 10 years. And a lot of these cities 
when we first met with them, had the same um, fleet issues that the city of Seal Beach uh, faces today. And we've been able to help them grow their fleet, um, manage a better, more efficient fleet, um, bridge the funding gaps that they have so they can refresh their fleet in a more timely manner, and then also cut costs and improve the safety of the vehicles. Next slide, please. As a company, Enterprise offers everything that you see here uh, in this circle, uh, from acquisition of vehicles to funding, safety, maintenance, fuel, um, telematics, and reseller vehicles. We understand that the city has an in-house uh, mechanics and although Enterprise will help with the acquisition and the funding of the vehicles, the city will continue to maintain the vehicles in-house. Next slide, please. One of the ways that we help our municipal customers with having an effective vehicle life cycle is really understanding the three parts uh, that make up the optimal time to replace vehicles. So as the vehicle depreciates, it is worth less and less money as time goes on. Uh, maintenance and fuel are the complete opposite. When you have a new vehicle, you're only doing oil changes on the vehicle. So the maintenance is very low. And then as time goes on, the cost for maintenance and fuel increases. And the optimal time is where you see that sweet spot. Um, many times that is about four to five years. Um, and if the city continues to keep the vehicles for a longer period of time, maybe 10, 15, 20 years, then you will see that the value of the vehicles are worth less, but you're spending a lot more money on fuel and maintenance. Next slide, please. Here's a great example of our buying power. Look at um, a 2020 F-150. If you look at the Ford's website, the retail pricing or MSRP, is about $39,560. Because the city is a municipal entity, um, you are entitled to get government pricing. So it's based on invoice minus all the rebates um, using the source well piggybacking contract. Um, the price to the city would be about $26,124, which is a lot less than what the sticker price of the vehicle is. And I think, can you move the slide uh, down a little bit to show the rest of it? There we go. And this slide shows that if we were to sell a one-year-old vehicle, that is a 2019 F-150 crew cab with about 4,400 miles, the sale price would be 27,800. And the city would buy that vehicle for about $26,124. So you can see that the city would actually make money um, if we sold that vehicle with 4,400 miles um, and being one year old. Same is true for if we sold a two-year-old vehicle um, with about 20,000 miles on it, the sale price of that vehicle would be about 25,600. And in essence, the city would pay about $524 of capital outlay to run that vehicle for two years because of the low mileage that the city is doing on the vehicles and the high rebates that we're getting from the manufacturers. However, most cities keep their vehicles for about 10 to 12 years. So if you were to sell a 2008 Ford F-150 with close to about 100,000 miles, that vehicle is only worth about $3,500. So in essence, you're paying close to $22,000 for that vehicle. So that's where um, the right time to cycle out vehicle becomes very important um, in helping the city reduce its total overall costs of ownership of the vehicles. Next slide, please. We performed an analysis on the city's fleet. We did two actually, one for non public safety, all the city's public works fleet, and then another one for a public safety fleet. For the non-public safety fleet, there are 23 vehicles in the fleet, and we're keeping all 23 vehicles. Typically, you cycle out non-public um, safety fleet at about 11 years, traveling about 4,600 miles. 
Our proposed cycle is to shorten that to about a four to five year cycle. So our recommendation is 4.3 years. Um, currently, the city is spending about $138.91 on maintaining the public works fleet. Um, with a shorter term, the proposed maintenance would be about $27.01 to maintain the vehicles because now you're looking at a newer vehicle with safety features and um, you're only doing oil changes on those vehicles versus older vehicles that have higher ticket items like engines transmission issues. So the city actually uh, would save on fuel as well because currently the old fleet um, it has about 10 miles per gallon and the new fleet would have about 12.5 miles per gallon um, on the vehicles. If you look at the orange bar in the middle of the page, this is what the city is currently doing with your fleet of vehicles. So the city has about 23 vehicles in the fleet. Typically, you replace about one vehicle um, every year. And like Kelly mentioned, because of capital shortfalls, some years you're not replacing vehicles, some years you're replacing a few more, but on average you're replacing about two vehicles every year. So you own 23 vehicles, you lease zero, the cost to pay cash for the two vehicles is about $60,000. You're not currently leasing right now. The city is spending about $38,000 to maintain the vehicles, $31,000 to fuel the vehicles. So the total fleet budget is about $130,000. Our recommendation for the first year is for the city to replace four vehicles. You own 19 vehicles, you lease four. And um, with the vehicles that we're leasing, we can also help the city with aftermarket coordination. So any state beds, utility bodies, toolboxes, we can include that into the cost of the lease as well. And that is where you see that 2145, that's the cost of some of the aftermarket for the vehicles. The lease cost for four vehicles is about $28,000. We would help the city sell the four vehicles that you have that are older in your fleet. And that we estimate to be about $24,838. The maintenance costs would decrease from 38,000 to about 32,000 because now four of the new vehicles in the fleet are newer and require less maintenance. Fuel is the same. It decreases from 31,000 to about 30,000. So your overall fleet budget actually decreases from 130,000 to 68,000. So in the first year, the city is actually saving $61,000. Over a 10 year span, the total savings would be $473,000. Next slide, please. With the public safety fleet, it follows the same format, 32 vehicles um, with a flip to the bottom 10 year savings of a little bit over a million dollars for the public safety fleet. Because I think the biggest difference is that the maintenance cost for the public safety fleet is $337 per vehicle per month versus if you have a newer fleet, um, the maintenance would drop to about $89. So overall, the public safety fleet would have a savings of close to a million dollars over a 10 year period. Next slide, please. Enterprise as a company, we sell about 1.1 million vehicles every year. So we buy close to a million vehicles and then we also sell close to a million vehicles. And we have a whole remarketing department that employs about 700 dedicated employees and that's all they do is sell vehicles on a daily basis. So over year over year, we typically outperform uh, what we call Black Book or the wholesale market um, by 11%. And lately with COVID and the microchip shortage and all the parts shortages, um, new vehicles have become very, very limited. Um, so this, the sale price of used vehicles have skyrocketed. And in July um, 2021 versus July of 2020, we've seen an increase of about over 24% of the prices for used vehicles. So now is a great time for the city to start a program that would help cycle out the old vehicles and get new vehicles into your fleet. Next slide, please. Okay. 
And how we utilize the program is through an open-ended lease. So with the open-ended lease, it is not like a traditional dealership lease where you have a set amount of mileage and then over mileage charges if you go over early termination penalties if you um, want to get out of the lease early. So that type of lease we can also do, but we do not recommend that for the city's program because the city has commercial use vehicles and you will have dings and dents on those vehicles because you're using it for everyday business for the city. We would recommend an open-ended lease structure, which means there's no mileage restrictions, no abnormal wear and tear, and no early termination penalties. The city has all rights of ownership. And at the end of the term of the lease, the city has all rights to the equity of the vehicle. So for example, if a vehicle is $25,000 in delivered price, if we write it down to zero, that's straight finance. With this open-ended lease structure, we would leave a reduced book value of about $10,000. At the end of the term, we would sell that vehicle for the city and we would sell that vehicle for about $17,500. And that leaves the city with $7,500 in equity. All that money belongs to the city. And if you would like to use that as a down payment on the new vehicle, that would dramatically um, lower the monthly payment for your next new vehicle. And that's the, the main basis of the open-ended lease is that the city has all rights of ownership and all the equity goes back to the city to put back into the fleet replacement plan. Next slide, please. I'll actually take over from here, Fawn. Thank you. So what does all of this mean to the city of Seal Beach? With the leasing options from Enterprise, we are able to replace a vehicle sooner, achieve a lower to total cost of ownership by maximizing discounts and resale value, reduce maintenance costs, thereby saving the general fund money, and ensure the city's fleet, both public safety and non-public safety, is operating efficiently and effectively. Next slide, please. To wrap things up, our goal tonight is to introduce the vehicle lease option and to discuss any questions that the city council may have. A, a very similar presentation was given to our executive team and members of staff and overall the response was favorable and Enterprise was able to answer uh, all of the questions they had. And they did have the opportunity to ask a number of questions um, which we would expect from the council tonight as well. Um, once we obtain feedback from City Council, uh, we will work with the City Departments to finalize the initial vehicle list uh, request list and then bring back the final request list and a master lease agreement for City Council consideration at a future City Council meeting. Next slide. And that concludes our presentation and we're available with, for any questions. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, let's start with uh, with Mike Verapapa. Do you have questions? Uh, yeah, just a couple of uh, quick ones. Um, what model, like for example, what model F one fifties would that include? Um, the XL, XLT. I wouldn't imagine a Lariat or a Limited, but what what? How would that work? The, the beauty of this program is that we have any vehicle that the city needs at our disposal. Um, and it's really dependent upon what the vehicle's uses are intended to be, um, you know, what, what um, really the department needs. Um, the way Enterprise works is we would order these from the factory through Enterprise, so they would be built to spec. Um, particularly for public safety, um, that's one of the uh, big selling points with uh, enterprise is they get the vehicle that they want uh, with the financing that helps the finance department. Um, and it, they don't have to worry about what's available on the lots. They build it custom for their needs. So for the examples that you showed with the dollar figures, what, what type of vehicle, what model vehicle was that then? I mean, cause you kind of gave some scenarios on the yes. previous lines, slides. Was that just a basic model or was that? Typically it is a work truck uh, crew cab. So what the example shows was a crew cab work truck. Oh, pardon me, a what truck? A crew cab work truck, uh, XL. An XL level, okay. 
Mm -hmm. Is that currently what the city has now, or Excel versions? I'm not actually sure. I don't have that the vehicle list in front of me. I, uh, I could pull it up. Um, okay. I'm just curious. Maybe for next time you could um, bring sure. it with me. And then, because we'll um, it's you know, it's obviously nice to compare apples to apples. I mean, we don't want to, you know, price out one car and then you know either downsize or upsize or whatever we're doing with these other vehicles. Now you, you said that they're they come equipped with all the equipment needed, like, um, you know, beacons above the, uh, on the roof and, and extra lighting and maybe radios and such. Um, is that, is that the case? I mean, I know, I know they can be built however we want, but for the price that's being shown, is that including that with that price? Yes, that pricing includes the aftermarket for the vehicles as specified by the city. So if the city is looking for beacon lights or toolboxes, bin liners, utility bodies, we worked with Kelly and her team to put together the pricing based on what they currently have apples to apples. And what about, um, and how long was the lease roughly? I forgot, I, I, I missed that part. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? What, what was the lease term? Was it two years, three years, four years? Five years. Five years? Oh. And, and what about um, like electric vehicles or electric trucks? How does that come into play? Enterprise has access to electric vehicles as well. A lot of our customers right now utilize hybrid vehicles, electric vehicles. Some also utilize CNG vehicles. The Enterprise can access any of those electric vehicles um, as the city wishes based on the um, infrastructure that the city currently has. Is that currently more expensive or a lot more or a little bit more or how, how is that option come into play? Yes, uh, electric vehicles are typically about five to $7,000 more than it's gas comparables. And the gas price you showed on your slide was $3 a gallon? That is based on the gas price that we use for the analysis. In Seal Beach, I think it's a little bit over $4, but we are very conservative in our analysis. So if we use $4, the savings would be a lot higher. Okay, all right. Um, I'd like to see, not right now, but like to hear some of the feedback from you know some of the um, vehicle users at, at some time, just so I can kind of get their input. But um, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, how about uh, Tom? <clears throat> you. Um, this looks really good. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Did, what uh, if we get locked into these leases? I didn't look carefully at the agreements, but can like five years from now? Is there the the risk that these leases increase quite a bit, or what, what's in the uh, agreement? The open, with the open-ended leases, the city would pay down on the vehicles um, every year, so it is fixed and guaranteed for the term of the lease. At the end of the five-year term, the city has the option to either buy out the vehicles, extend the lease for another year or two, or um, have us sell the vehicles and uh, get the city a new vehicle. And if I could add to that, um, one thing I do wanna point out about this program is the only commitment the city would be making, and, and of, of course, this isn't an item that's before you tonight, this is something we'd bring back in the future. When we were to present a lease agreement for consideration, the only commitment the city has is to lease the first year of vehicles. Essentially the vehicles that we would place on order um, with the, the signing of the agreement. The, the annual cost associated with those vehicles um, is fixed. So it's very similar to a loan financing rather than a lease financing. The difference is that there is a residual value built in. And as Fawn mentioned, you have a number of different options at the end of that term. 
but we are not committed, um, say we don't, you know, this program isn't necessarily working for Seal Beach the way that we had hoped it would. And we go down the path of year one. And when we get to year two, we decide not to replace um, any additional vehicles through leases, we are not obligated to. Um, it is only the first year of leases that we would be obligated for. Okay, that's all my questions. Thanks. Okay, let's see. Who have I missed? Uh, Shelly? Um, yes, I, I also had a question about the uh, the aftermarket or the it see it takes quite a bit to upfit those so i was just quite wondering if that penciled out but since it's built in that uh, that sort of answers that question um since there is a shortage of new vehicles now are we going to have problems finding the vehicles that we want and did you say that any rebates there are that we would get we would be able to get those Yes, any rebates that um, the, I guess we would call it municipal rebates, the city would be entitled to. So the pricing plan based on the source well contract would be invoice pricing minus all the rebates to the city. And um, our vehicle, are, are certain vehicles hard to get now if we want, if we want uh, police cruisers or, or maintenance trucks, uh, are we limited in what we can pick? The ideal plan would be to factory order the vehicles from the different manufacturers. So for the police cruisers, we would order either the Ford Explorer or the Dodge Chargers, whichever models the city would like to order. And then for all the other vehicles, we would recommend that the city orders directly from the manufacturer get exactly what you want. The manufacturer will build it exact to the specs. And then when it's done, they will ship it out to a dealership in Orange County. And then we would uh, deliver it to the city if there are no aftermarket. If there is aftermarket, Enterprise would actually take the vehicles to the aftermarket vendors. Um, and then when it's ready, turnkey to go, we would deliver it to the city. And that's when the city would pay for the vehicles. So even though it will take several months for the factory to build the vehicles, the city does not have any upfront costs until we deliver the vehicles to the city. Okay, and, thank you, thank you. Council members of Starstick, if I could add one more thing. Um, it, sure. Especially because our departments did ask this question when we were evaluating the lease option. Um, Enterprise has two options when they looked for a vehicle for the city. They can factory order or enterprise can purchase straight off of a lot, just like we can. Um, right now, the factory orders are um, a bit behind where we would like them to be. Um, and a lot of that is because of the, the chip shortage that the vehicles use, mm -hmm. um, which every dealership across the country is experiencing. Um, so ideally, and this is part of why we're pushing to bring this to council today, and then hopefully at the first meeting in September for consideration, We'd like to get these vehicles ordered as quickly as we can because of that delay. Um, where if we were to to wait a little bit longer, um, we also have the the potential of having to wait for the next model year, which would cause a couple more months delay. But a lot of that is because of the chip shortage. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just I want to clarify with regard to uh, upfitting. Um, I'm assuming that um, the installation of the extras, whether it be running boards, toolboxes, bed liners, and all of those things that enterprise would take care of. But I, uh, I would ask, and it, that doesn't include the upfitting of computers, uh, radios, sirens, and, and, you know, emergency lighting. I assume that we would continue to take that vehicle to an upfitter? Actually, enterprise will take care of that for us. Um, we can use any upfitting company that that uh, the police department, that Marine Safety or Public Works wants to use. Enterprise will deliver the vehicle to those upfitters, put all of the equipment in it that is necessary, and then Enterprise will pick it up and deliver it to us, fully equipped with everything that we need, ready to use. Um, the only reason that Enterprise is involved is because they roll 
the cost of those add-ons into the price of the lease. So we're right. able to finance those costs as well, but there are no restrictions <clears throat> on the type of equipment or the vendor um, location even. Um, that is that is fully determined by the city. Gotcha. Well, that's good. Um, you know, I can offer um, one endorsement. Um, I've spoken with the um, just retired uh, deputy chief of the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department and they've been using enterprise for some time and are very, very pleased with, uh, with that relationship. So I thought I would just put that out there. And the idea of leasing, I mean, it would be certainly new to us, but it's, it's really no different than um, there have been companies um, that are not car dealers, but they're just leasing companies. And you can lease a, uh, you know, a, a big piece of heavy equipment, or you can lease a truck, or you can lease a car. And in this case, you know, Enterprise is, you know, leasing um, automobile and, and trucks and so forth, and providing, in a sense, what amounts to sort of no down financing and great service, and uh, with more options. And if we go to a dealer and try and, and, try and find the vehicles we want, um, on our own and then have to deal with all of the ups and extras and upfitting and so forth. So, um, you know, from a financial standpoint, it seems to be, um, it, to me anyway, it seems to be a, a, a great way to go. So any have, other questions? I have a couple. Sure, Sandra, go ahead. Um, have I noticed the uh, book rate was a comparison to the lease uh, opportunity? What did you do any comparisons by any chance, Kelly, to the uh, California, the state of California vehicle purchasing program that we've been tying into? Uh, for years in order to get um, a discount on cars we purchase um, or vehicles that we purchase. Have you done any comparison to what that might be, to what this is, in terms of just purchasing? Sure. Um, in terms of purchasing, we are able to get um, manufacturer discounts, which we're, we traditionally are purchasing from the lots, from, from other, from fleet departments at dealerships, um, even through the California program. When I first got here and started looking at our trial balance and looking at the vehicle replacement fund, um, I did look at the purchasing options, especially because we were right in the middle of budget development for fiscal year uh, 19. Oh, goodness. 2021. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is we just don't have the capital. That's our biggest challenge. Even if it were 10% cheaper um, to purchase, we, you know, we only have so much cash flow and, and there really isn't a surplus at this point. Um, but we are in dire need of ordering some vehicles, um, particularly in our police department. And there's a little bit of money sitting in our vehicle replacement fund. Um, but once it's gone, it's gone. And we don't have the capital to replace other vehicles. So we're looking at more of a holistic approach to addressing the quality of the fleet as a whole. Um, and when we looked at the purchasing option, it was really going to be, um, I, I hate to use this term, kicking the can down the road but it kind of was, we would have solved the short-term solution, but not really solved the long-term problem. One of my question, well, my next question was going to be how much is in the replacement fund and how much will be available to lease vehicles uh, uh, with a startup of the program? Are right. we going to be able, are we going to be able to, fund a, a full replacement of the cars that are, or vehicles that need to be replaced? So in year one, that's actually a really good question. In year one, 
Um, there, there are a number of vehicles that need to be replaced in year one that we will not have the funding for. Um, what we've done uh, is worked with Enterprise to build out a five-year full replacement plan. Um, looking at the, the highest priority vehicles first in that, in that year one, we worked with the police department and public works to determine what that list looked like. And then in the future years, um, this is a commitment that we really need to make in order to get the fleet back to where it needs to be. Um, it would be one of the first items that we would budget. Uh, right now, we do have a little over 400000 in cash sitting in the vehicle replacement fund. So I would propose that those be the first funds used um, to pay for uh, the, the year one uh, vehicle leases. Um, that would be more than enough to pay for that, as well as any upfitting costs that are necessary. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we would budget it going forward so that we had full replacement. Um, one of the things that I do want to point out is a number of years ago, um, I believe it was either maybe 2013 or 2014, um, we went through this very same process. Um, we had a third party come out and take a look at our current vehicle replacement program, or back then what was current, and they developed a funding plan to make sure we always had money in our vehicle replacement fund to ensure vehicles were being replaced in a specific, in a certain timeline. Um, we follow, we were able to follow that plan for the first few years. And then in fiscal year 16, 17, when money got tight, it became very challenging to fund the 310,000 that was supposed to be set aside every year. Um, that really has, it has posed another challenge that we're trying to address. Um, so clearly the, the purchase option hasn't been working for us. We anticipated doing that after the 2013 review. It lasted for a few years and we're right back in the same boat less than 10 years later. Um, so we really are looking for a long-term solution. Um, and I, we really do feel like leasing is that, is that option. Thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. Uh, just a question. Does Enterprise ever, um, would they ever be interested or involved in any specialty vehicle purchases or leasing? Um, you know, whether it's a, a street sweeper type of vehicle or some of our the specialty trucks that that the city uses, whether it's a dump truck or, you know, a vacuum truck. I mean, they all are purchased by various manufacturers. So, I mean, it, it's, it's still, it's the same um, principle, but whether or not enterprise uh, gets involved in any of those types of purchases and leasing. It is an option with enterprise, um, but it's, it's an option to purchase the vehicle portion of it. It doesn't always make sense. Um, when we were going through the evaluation and analysis of our current fleet, we had that conversation with Enterprise. They currently do not do large heavy machinery, vector trucks. Um, if it's something that requires the body of a truck and it's just a matter of, of, um, of fixing equipment to the back of it, then we can lease the truck through them, but it would predominantly be public safety vehicles, um, police and marine safety, and uh, public works, work trucks um, that are not specialty equipment, as well as our pool vehicles um, that we have here at City Hall. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions of staff discussion? Okay, well, thank you very much, Kelly, and thank you to Enterprise for a very concise uh, presentation. All right, here we are, adjournment. Um, we're now going to adjourn the City Council to Monday, September 13th, 2021, which means the August 23rd, 2021 meeting has been canceled at 5.30 to meet in closed session if deemed necessary. 
So thank you everyone for your attendance and patience this evening, and we will see you in September. Have a good evening. Thank you.